All right, good morning, family. I want to welcome you all to our worship service today. I hope you are ready to worship God because we are, and uh, we're going to start off singing, I love the Lord your God. Please join with us in singing and worshiping. You can snap or you can clap. Go ahead and stand on up for me. Stand up. I know you're on the couch. Sing this with us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Listen. song that we're going to sing is called Sense Your Love. What I want you to do is just take a quick moment and just close your eyes and I want you to actually think about what your life was like before God, before Jesus, before the cross. And I want you to actually picture what that was like. Uh, you don't have to go into anything graphic or anything of that nature, but just what your life was like, what your heart was like. And now I want you to think about what has changed since the cross, since Jesus. Think about your family. Think about your children. Think about your marriage. And think about your life and the impact that God has had on your life. And I want you to sing Since Your Love with us. You are the light, 
song of my life, you always lead, you are the voice inside, you are my love, no one before you, all that I am, points to you, and I was made. And I was made for you, and I am unfulfilled without full Sing that again to God. Say, you are the light. You are the light, the song of my life. You always lead. You are the voice inside. You are my love. There's no one before you. All that I am points to you. And I was made by you, and I was made for you, and I am unfulfilled without full communion. Sing it again. I was made. I was made. And I was made for you, and I am unfulfilled without full communion. Since your love got a hold of me, since your love got a hold of me, I'm a new creation. I'm forever changed since your love got a hold of me. Since your love got a hold of me. I'm a new creation. I'm forever changed since your love got a hold of me. Since your love got a hold of me. I'm a new creation. I'm forever changed, yeah, since your love got a hold of me, since your love got a hold of me. I'm a new creation, I'm forever changed, I was made by you, and I was made. in you.
Good morning, Cornerstone family and friends. My name is Doug Neiman, and this is my lovely wife, Kay. We've been married for just a little over 23 years, and we have learned a lot about one another. And one of the things that we've learned is that we do best together when we each do our part the way God set it up in marriage. Today is Valentine's Day, a day originally set aside for lovers to show one another their affection with greetings and gifts. However, it was later extended to include not only lovers, but family, friends, and relatives. According to history, this day began in the 1500s, and by the late 1700s, commercially printed cards were being used. <laughs> Ooh. That's been when Hallmark started. Hmm. Now, you may be wondering, wondering, what do all these fun facts have to do with church? Well, you know, Kay... The Bible has been considered to be one of the greatest love letters ever written. Psalms 103 is helps us uh, or shows us why it deserves um, and shows us the extent of God's love for us. Here are just a few things that it says that are examples of his love. He forgives us our sins. He heals our diseases. Redeems us from the pit. He crowns us with love and compassion. He is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. We are honored that you are here with us today and hope that all of us can understand that we are loved and valued by God. Let's enjoy praising and worshiping him on this great day of love and affection. Let us pray. God in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to worship and praise you today. We pray that our hearts are open to the, and hearing about your message of love. Let our worship be pleasing to you. Be with Fenton as he brings us the message and let it all be um, precious and gracious to you. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. All right, at this time, we're going to pray for our contribution. Uh, also, I know that we normally also pray for benevolence the first Sunday of each month. Uh, since we didn't do that last week, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for that this week as well. And uh, if you do want to give to benevolence, you could do that at any time. So uh, please pray with me. Uh, Father, we just thank you so much for uh, your love and your compassion. Uh, Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and how you constantly give to us uh, things that really we ultimately don't deserve, but we are so grateful, God, and we strive to live our lives for you. And I uh, do know that sometimes we fall short, uh, but we thank you for your mercy. Uh, we pray that you will bless this money uh, that's being given for our regular contribution as well as the benevolence contribution, uh, that those that are in need, uh, that their needs will be provided for through us, and uh, I pray that you will give us the funds to be able to give to both, give us the funds to be able to uh, serve, to be able to uh, shower people with love, and for people to feel uh, the love of you through us. Uh, God, I pray for those that are in uh, charge financially, uh, that you would guide them uh, mentally and in every other way, and uh, give them wisdom in what they're doing. And please multiply the money that's given. We thank you so much. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to be singing Reckless Love. spoken word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. So, so kind to me.
you won't kick down, lie that you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall that you won't kick down, lies that you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall that you won't kick down, lie that you won't tear down, coming after me. Still you give yourself away Good morning, Cornerstone, and happy Valentine's Day. Love is in the air. 
Amen. Go ahead and uh, turn your Bibles over to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to begin there in a moment. Uh, we are doing our series on relationships this month, right? That's our reword for the month. And today we're going to be talking about a very special relationship. So last week we looked at our relationship with God, which is of paramount importance, our most, relation, our most important relationship, period. And today we're going to look at what I think is our second most important relationship, and that is the relationship of marriage, or mawage. A dream within a dream, right? If you've seen uh, The Princess Bride. But the institution of marriage is, is probably as old as time. Right? I mean, if you go back to the first pages of Genesis, it, we can see that it is something extremely important uh, to God's heart. Now, yes, before Genesis was written down and delivered to the Israelites, there were societies and cultures that had the institute of marriage, right? So it's not something that, um, we, you know, we can say one particular religion came up with, but we just think the God of the universe, right, determined that marriage is something that is important. Um, it is something that has actually evolved over time. I mean, when you look at a lot of ways, the original purpose of marriage, it had to do with property. <laughs> it had to do with, I'm going to give this woman to your son in exchange for sheep and goats and riches, etc. It was about enlarging one's household. Secondarily, you know, to procreate right, to, 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 to grow families and to build families, uh, something that we looked at. And, you know, more recently in times, we've said marriage is really, and it should be the product of love, right? You find that person, that special person that you really like, and they really like you, and you go from like to love, and then you get married, right? But this idea of dating and marry, marrying for love is actually a pretty new idea, really, in the last just couple of centuries. But Regardless of how it has evolved, I think we can be uh, certain in saying that marriage is fundamental to society. That, and the, the, the scriptures that do talk about it, when we see God's heart for marriage, we can say it's fundamental to Christianity as well. But despite the fact that it's fundamental to society and Christianity, you know, I think in a lot of ways, we can treat society, we can treat marriage the way individuals treat diet and exercise. Like it's something that we know is important. It's something that we know we should give time and attention to. It's something that we know needs to have regular work put into it. But just like, you know, when it's leg day and you skip it, <laughs> in a lot of ways, there are other things that we put in front of marriage or we put before marriage. I mean, some of those things, you can think about the easy pickings, right? The low-hanging fruit, job. I mean, so many people invest a lot of time, energy, even money, if it's a business they're starting, into a job to the neglect of their spouse and their household. I mean, we even have this, which is kind of a ridiculous term when you think about it, but it's just sort of where we're at in society. You ever heard the term, this person is, uh, somebody might say, that's my work wife yep. or my work husband. We've gotten to a point in society where people say, you know, there's this person at work that I spend more time with, oh, wow. right, that I have in some ways a deeper relationship, a deeper bond with in some regards for some folks than my actual spouse. And it's a sad state of affairs. It leads to affairs, right? Jobs are one of the, the, the places that affairs often come from and spring out of is, is, is situations at work. But after a job, one of the things that can get put in front of marriage is our children. And here's the deal. We love them. Children are great. Children are a gift from God. I, I love my daughters. They are amazing. It is, it is such a blessing to be a parent. But think about this. Well, if somebody were to say, man, I'll do anything for my kids, without blinking, we, we laud and applaud that. But if you hear somebody say, I'd do anything for my husband. I'd do anything for my wife. To be fair, in this society, a lot of times, people might give you kind of a side eye. Like, well, don't you know they could... 
That relationship could end or dissolve or they could cheat on you. They could hurt. You know, it's one thing to feel that way about your kids, but your spouse, you shouldn't make those kind of statements. I mean, that's the world we live in. Even friendships sometimes can come in front of our marriages. I mean, think about how many people out there have regular guys poker night or guys, you know, uh, bowling night, but don't have regular date night. How many uh, women do we know out there get away for a girl's weekend? But how often do you you and your spouse take a couple's weekend? And so there are so many things that we often can put in front of marriage relationship. But today, I want to just sort of look at scriptures. And today is definitely more sharing and teaching than it is preaching. Because to be honest, this is one of those topics where uh, uh, preaching a sermon about it, in a lot of ways, just being 100% real, I feel like I have imposter syndrome. Like, how am I going to get up here and talk about marriage? Right, because I've got a ton of flaws, and Natasha and I are not perfect. As a matter of fact, this week was really actually a tough week for us. I mean, between we had to be quarantined, uh, as we were waiting on COVID test results, we were negative our whole household, amen. Um, Chloe turned 16 years old this week, which is a whole nother sermon and topic in itself, having a 16-year-old. But trying to plan for a safe way to celebrate with her, I mean, there were just challenges this week. Matter of fact, this morning, I called Byron, you know, when Byron got here to, uh, to sing, I said, hey, can we just talk and pray for a little bit? I just wanted to get open, confess some sin. I wanted to get some advice and just pray because I just felt like, man, I can't even preach a sermon about this given the week, in some ways, the week that I had. But I am so grateful, I am so grateful that God still uses us even when we're messed up, even when we have broken relationships, even when we're not perfect, because he sent his perfect son, and as we imitate and follow him, God can use us. And so I'm so grateful. You know, I don't think Byron and Danielle would say they have a perfect marriage. But I'm so grateful for the discipling I can get from them. Right? I, Greg and Vicky, I talk about them all the time. Right? They wouldn't say they've had a perfect marriage. But I'm just so grateful that they, they use scriptures and prayer and the love they have for us to speak into our life, to help us to be more like Jesus in, in me and Natasha's relationship with each other. And I'm so extremely grateful and thankful for all the couples we've had in our lives over the years. And I, I tell you, if you're, if you're one of those couples out there and you just, you don't have people in your life, man, it is so amazing. It is so helpful. It is so rewarding. And it is just awesome to be true, to, to tell you the truth when you have other couples in there with you. But if you don't get anything from me today, I do want to say this one phrase that, that a couple, Richard and Celise Dixon from Kansas City, uh, they said to us, uh, understand this, marriage is not 50-50. It's not. Marriage is 100, 100, 100. It's three individuals giving it all they got. It's the husband giving it all, It's the wife giving her all, and it's God giving his all to your marriage relationship. The Bible says God hates divorce. I mean, God is the one that says a man needs to leave his household and go be joined to his wife. God is giving 100% to your marriage. And so we ought to as well. And so with that in mind, look over in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. That's our first verse for today. We're going to start off uh, with Ecclesiastes 4. Let's see, my clicker. Are we on? There we go. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verses 9 through 12. It says this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either fails, his companion can lift him up. Another translation says his friend can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Again, a cord of three strands. Three individuals giving 100%. God, the husband, and the wife. And so what I want to talk about today are three aspects of marriage uh, that I think can help us to have great marriages. And if you're at a spot where you don't feel like you have a great marriage, guess what? It's not too late. These principles can be put into place 
right? Through prayer and, and, and Bible study, fasting, maybe, maybe therapy is what some people need, couples therapy, or maybe just discipling. I don't know, but, but your mar- guess what? Your best days can be ahead of you in marriage, regardless of how you're feeling about you and your spouse right now. Right? God is a God of resurrection, a God of renewal, a God of relationship. And he wants your marriage to succeed even more than you probably do. And so I want to talk about three principles in marriage that can help us. The first uh, principle I want to talk about is that husbands and wives need to be friends. We can look at the next slide. And so not only am I going to talk to husbands and wives, but I also want to talk to some singles and dating couples or engaged couples out there as well. But these are principles that I think can really help us to have great, great marital relationships. But the first is that of friendship. See, I love Natasha and my friendship. I really feel like the, the irons of our marriage were forged in the summers of 2001 and 2002. We didn't get married until 2004. But in those two summers, over those two summers, we became best friends. Yes, we went out on some dates, right, in the summer of 2001, went to Six Flags and, and, and some other things. And then, but really that summer of 2002, Natasha, she went to UGA, but that particular summer she was home uh, in Stone Mountain. I lived in Stone Mountain, and she was taking classes at Georgia State for a summer. And so she was a part of the Atlanta Church campus ministry uh, for those three months. And we would ride together to church basically every Sunday, every Wednesday, and if we had a devotional on Fridays. So I had a car, she didn't. And so we would, we would have this 35, 40 minute ride to Atlanta to go to church. And it was weasel time. <laughs> if you've been around a long time, you know that term. Uh, but uh, it was really during those car rides, during the conversations, the laughs, all sorts of things, we became best friends. And I really think that for those out there who are dating, for those out there who want to date, for those who maybe one day want to get married, a a good thing to understand, a really important and and pivotal thing to understand is your marriage has to start with a friendship. I mean, it is so important to just be great friends. Look at what it says here in Proverbs chapter 27 about friendship. It says in verse 5, Better an open rebuke than concealed love. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive, or an enemy multiplies kisses. A person who is full tramples on a honeycomb, but to a hungry person, any bitter thing is sweet. Any wandering from his home is like a bird wandering from its nest. Oil and incense bring joy to the heart, and the sweetness of a friend is better than self-counsel. So there are lots of scriptures that talk about friendship. I just wanted to sort of uh, key in on this one. You know, this idea that uh, uh, your marriage is going to be based in a friendship. It says friendship, the sweetness of a friend, is better than self-counsel. If you've been listening to uh, uh, Bema, one of the things he talks about in Genesis with Adam and Eve and that whole idea of not a suitable, help, suitable helper was found for Adam, um, uh, Marty Solomon explains this idea that uh, the suitable helper really comes from a term meaning the help that opposes. And he gives this analogy that it's sort of like two boards being leaned up against each other. They can only stand up if they're leaned up against each other. But, but, but in, in addition to being a support, they're also a pressure. They're on opposite sides. And so your marriage, that, that, that helper that opposes, that suitable helper, it's meant to be somebody that, that is a great friend to you. Somebody that you can talk to about anything. Somebody, and I love how Steve uh, Gooch and Betsy, or at least Steve explained this to me. He said, you know, Betsy is his biggest cheerleader and sometimes his biggest critic. He, he wants to bounce ideas off of her. He wants to uh, let her know the inner thinkings of his mind, his ideas, his proposed solutions to problems, right? He wants to talk to her about it. And, and you know, she's the one person that can probably say some things that nobody else could say to Steve. And vice versa. And, and, and you only get to that sort of relationship in marriage if it starts out as a friendship. Yeah. Right? The type of relationship where you can talk freely. You can share the inner you. You can completely let the walls down. Right? That's what that, you know, that starts as a friendship. It's the type of relationship where silence is okay. 
You're able to just sit in silence, but silence is not prolonged. You talk to each other, you communicate. It's the type of relationship where you have inside jokes and nicknames for each other. It's the type of relationship where you have games and fun and movies and laughs. It's the type of relationship where you have tears and sorrow and joy and heartbreak, but it starts in a friendship. And the way I think about it is how our friendships built, really they're built through time spent and memories made. You know, not only because God says we shouldn't get divorced or not just because we have children, but I I wouldn't want to be separated from Natasha because she's my best friend. I think about the memories that we've created together, whether it's going to Super Bowl together, being at presidential inauguration together, going on a zombie run together. That was a fun marathon. Uh, I remember the night when Chloe was born, just how terrified we were when the nurse left the room. And we were like, you're, you're leaving us with this child? <laughs> and we often joke about that. We both were just kind of looking at each other like, what are we supposed to do? She was like, I don't know. What are we supposed to do? <laughs> and we would just take turns checking to see if she was breathing, right? You know, those first parents always do that sort of thing. But those memories... We have a friendship. We have memories built together. Just the other day, I walked in the kitchen and I said, hey, Natasha, she was sitting down at at the table. I I don't remember what she was doing on her phone or eating lunch or something. I said, hey, honey, can you do me a favor? And before I got it out of my mouth, she said, hey, you want me to make you some eggs? And I was just like, how did you? Of course you know. I mean, she just, she just knows me because we have a great friendship. We built a friendship and a life together. And so our marriage relationship should start in friendship. Unfortunately, one of the lies we get from society is that marriage is just, you know, the old ball and chain. It's oppression to keep you down. I read a quote, it was meant to be funny. It says, I didn't know what happiness was until I got married, but then it was too late. (laughs) You know, that's a lot of ways how society looks at it. But I think of it, I think the way God intended it for us is to be this fun friendship, to be this companionship, to have a buddy that you go through life with. Two are better than one. They have a great return for their work. So first and foremost, I think we need to look at the, the, the friendship aspect of our marriage. It comes from talking, communication, shared time, shared experiences, doing life together. The same thing we say about our life groups, that should be happening in our marriage relationship. If you go to the next slide, um, the second aspect of marriage is in addition to being best friends, we're meant to be excited and passionate lovers. Right? I mean, you haven't heard too many sermons from Song of Songs, right? It's only maybe at marriage retreats, but I'm going to go there a little bit today. Over in Song of Songs, chapter 5 and verse 16, uh, this is the, the, there's lots of speakers in this book. There's a, the husband, the wife, her friends, a lot of different people are speaking. And this is one of the lines she says in chapter 5. It says, his mouth is sweetness. He is absolutely desirable. This is my love. Another translation says, this is my lover and this is my friend young women of Jerusalem. She was telling all of her friends about her betrothed, about her beloved, and saying, this is my friend. Got to start with friendship, but this is my lover. You know, um, for all the single and uh, maybe dating folks out there, a a big thing I want you to understand is, man, it is so important to guard your purity. It is so important to not let there be a hint of immorality or impurity or of greed or any other uncleanness. You know, I've told my story before, right? As a teenager, I was very, I was into a lot of immorality. And one of the things I feel like I I definitely know and learn is there's a reason God wants us to wait. There's a reason, right? It's not just God trying to hold you down. It's not just God trying to keep your fun. You know, there's so much, you know, when I think about the junk that's in my brain, right? Sometimes that stuff doesn't go away, and and fortunately with with time and years, it it can, right? But that's one of the reasons God doesn't want you to be with anybody else but your spouse. It's meant to be this special union between the two of you that only you two share. And so, you know, we we can't just give in to the lies that society tells us. The lies that you got to test drive the car before you buy it. 
You need to sow your wild oats and have a bunch of partners before you settle down to one. Those are lies. Those are lies from Satan. The lie that, you know, especially for, for guys, you got to sow your wild oats and get as, you know, you got to have experience when you come in to marriage. So you need to sleep around. I mean, we, we definitely know from, from history that there were fathers in certain times, time periods that would maybe at, 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 so apparently at their son's coming of age, they would go and, and get a prostitute for their son to spend the night with. Right? Because they thought this was sort of just a, a manly rite of passage. Again, that is a lie from the pit of hell. To all the parents out there, I want you to feel just as strongly that, hey, I want my daughter to be a virgin when she's married. I want you to feel just as strongly about your sons with that conviction. Amen. Right? We've got to have those kind of convictions. That is a lie from Satan that you need to have a bunch of partners, get a bunch of experience. Another lie from Satan is that, you know, only dating, only, only people that are boyfriend and girlfriend have good sex. I mean, when you think about our movies, whenever movies generally do talk about intimate relationship between couples, it's always a joke about how they don't have time for it because of the kids. Or it's always a joke about how it's not good or something like that, right? Generally, the image we get is, man, you know, wedding cake is, is the thing that's going to ruin your sex life. That's the food that's going to ruin your sex life is wedding cake. And that is a lie from Satan. But before we get there, I think it's important to understand that this idea of being lovers, it's not just physical, right? There's also a relationship or friendship. Look over in 1 Corinthians 13, a famous passage that, that is often read at weddings, um, but a, a famous passage that really sort of points out and describes what love is, what love is like. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4, it says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable or easily angered, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. There's another verse in the Bible that talks about God is love. And so you could go and replace, every time you see the word love in this text, you could replace it with God is patient, God is kind, God is not easily angered, so on and so forth. Well, I was once told that, you know, when it comes to a marriage relationship, you should get to a point where you can ask your spouse, honey, Natasha, could you fill in Fenton every time it says love there? Would Natasha say that Fenton is patient? Fenton is kind. He doesn't envy. He's not boastful. He's not arrogant or rude or self-seeking. Doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And so I think that is a goal to aspire to when I think about how I want to treat my wife. Yeah. I want to treat her the way God treats me. Mm -hmm. I want to give to her the way Jesus gives to me. And so, you know, when I think about this, probably the two biggest things on this list, you know, I struggle with are not being self-seeking. And I think a lot of men struggle with this right? I'm just giving this. I'm going to do this for you because I want you to do something for me. That's self-seeking love. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these chores so Natasha will do X, right? But love is not self-seeking. Love says, I'm going to give to you because I love you, because you're my friend, because you're my spouse, because you're my wife. I'm just going to give to you with, with no expectation that I'm going to get something in return. I also think about you know, love keeps no record of wrongs. This is, you know, one of the surefire ways to have a bad marriage, keep records of wrongs. And when we look at the, the magnitude of forgiveness that God has given us, how can we hold records of wrongs against our spouse? I mean, it makes me think about Jesus in that parable with the unmerciful servant, mm -hmm. right? He was forgiven the equivalent of millions of dollars and was willing to choke this guy and throw him in jail over hundreds of dollars. Right? That's what it's like when we keep records of wrong with our spouse. That's what it's like when we hold grudges because you did X to me. That's what it's like when you, you're bringing old arguments up from a grave, right? So you're in a, an argument that has nothing to do with something else, but you want to bring up something that happened two years ago, right? That kills great love in your marriage. And so I think 
one of the things that I've heard before is, you know, marriage is just two people deciding what they want to eat for dinner for the rest of their lives, <laughs> trying to figure out what we're going to have for dinner. But really, I think marriage is two people that are continually giving each other a lot of grace, a lot of forgiveness. Because the deal is, because Natasha is my closest neighbor, and I need to love my neighbor as myself, she's also the person I'm probably going to sin against the most. And so I get to reflect the love of Jesus by how much forgiveness I have for her. She gets to reflect the love of Jesus by how much grace and mercy she has for me. And so, you know, I probably, I, I wrote in here, you know, I probably made Natasha cry more than anybody else on the planet. You know, I'm going to sin against her the most, but, but I appreciate just how much grace, mercy, and love she's had for me over these years. I, uh, I saw this, again, it's meant to be a joke, it's not really that funny, but it was a couple arguing. And at the end of the argument, the husband says, how can somebody so beautiful be so stupid? He said that to his wife. And the wife responded, well, God made me beautiful so you'd marry me. God made me stupid so I'd marry you. You see, if that's the kind of dialogue and talk you're having, right, that isn't 1 Corinthians 13. You got to have 77 or 70 times 7 should you forgive. And that doesn't mean, again, keeping records of wrongs. All right, when I get to 491, I don't have to forgive her anymore. Right? Just forgive. Forgiveness is easier than math, right? All right? So just, just be forgiving. But I think these characteristics make for a great friendship, a great, a, a great love life, Right? But love isn't just these emotional things. It's also physical in a marriage relationship. Something somebody once told me is that, you know, sex starts in the kitchen, not in the bedroom. It really does start with being that great friend. It really does start with, with, with the entire day. Are you essentially making love to your wife's mind, to her heart, right? That's where it starts with this, with this relationship, which is why I think God wants us to be both friends and lovers, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, it says this. Now, in, the, in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to use a woman for sex. But because sexuality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again. Otherwise, Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all people were as I am, but each has his own gift from God. One person has this gift, another has that. I say to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them to remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it is better to marry than to burn with desire. You see, Paul is writing, there was a bunch of junk going on in Corinth. Uh, one of the problems was immorality, infidelity, sex with temple prostitutes, and all this. And he's saying, listen, sex is from God, and sex is meant for your marriage. But the thing is, we have to understand that it really is something that's from God. I mean, he wrote an entire book, there's an entire book, Song of Songs, on the beauty and joys of the sexual relationship in marriage. There's a book I, I'm going to recommend, and it's called Intended for Pleasure. You know, God intended that to be fun and pleasurable. You see, some societal mistakes we've seen over the course of history was this idea, one idea that it's only for procreation. Only do that unless you're, you're trying to have babies, Right? Well, that doesn't make sense. I mean, if you really think about the science, there's only about four to five days a month where you can actually get pregnant. And, you know, when, when women hit their 40s, 50s, they go through menopause, and you can't even have babies anymore. And it's not like the marriage is meant to just end there, right? God designed, right, for our intimate relationship to be a regular part of our marriage. But again, society has said it's either only for procreation or it got so prude, for example, like in Victorian society, that you had a situation where men only sort of, uh, men didn't even view their wives as, as, as sexual creatures. And so they would go out and, ha and have relations with prostitutes for the real fun. 
right? That, that, that's a crazy pendulum swing. That's not what God intended. Or you go to the, the sexual revolution in the, in the 60s and 70s that said that sleep with anybody and everybody. Marriage is just a made-up construct. And again, that's not what God intended it for. But I think when it comes to our physical relationships, it's something that we need to talk the talk and walk the walk. We need to talk about it, but you need to do it. I mean, it needs to just be a regular part of your marriage. Otherwise, you can be great friends, and essentially, you're just good roommates. And I don't think that's how God designed marriage, for us to just be good roommates. It's a gift from God. It shouldn't feel like a chore. So I know there are some couples out there, some couples, it's all about the schedule, and they have a schedule. There are some couples out there, it's all about spontaneity. Regardless of how you and your wife or your spouse talk about it and work it out, right, it just needs to be something where there is giving and fun and just a regular part of your marriage. Uh, one quick note, quickest way to kill this, part, this portion of your marriage, pornography and masturbation. Right? I think, you know, this is generally something that men mostly struggle with. This is why, again, it's so important to have people in your life, to have people that hold you accountable, to have people you can talk to about this, because that can kill a marriage. I know that's, that's generally a temptation for men, but it can be with women as well. You know what else can kill a marriage? It's withholding sex. Right? Is sort of overemphasizing it or underemphasizing it. Either way, right, the man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Right? So we've got to, in our relationships, we've got to come to a healthy, sort of a healthy middle ground on it. Here's a pro tip. Um, you know, I think a lot of us have been in this situation before where it's kind of like, you know, it's late at night or whatever, and the husband, you look over, and you're kind of trying to give your wife the eye, and, and you, you maybe can tell her. She says, honey, I'm tired. Pro tip for the husbands. Deny yourself. Say, honey, you get some rest. Right? We can, you know, let's, we, we can pick up later. It's, it's, it's fine. Don't get an attitude. Don't get sarcastic. Don't, you know, become mean. Don't, well, I'm just, just turn over with an attitude, right? Uh, Self-denial. Here's a pro tip for the wives. Uh, again, this one's for free. Something that can really, really help you out is if you say, well, honey, I'm really tired tonight, but tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening, let's make sure we get together. Right? And so just this idea of being giving and considering the other better than self. Finally, we can go to our next slide. The last thing that I think can make our marriages great is when we are partners. When we are partners in the gospel. So you see, I've heard it said before that men fall in love with their eyes. I'm attracted to you. <laughs> right? Women fall in love with their ears. He talks to me. He listens to me, right? And so you see in both of those things this idea that you need to be friends and lovers. But one of the distinguishing traits of Christian marriage is this idea that we are also brother and sister in Christ, that we are partners in the gospel. See, regardless of culture, religion, background, any couple can be friends and lovers. But the higher call, the call of discipleship of Jesus is that we're partners in the gospel, is that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at this verse over in Acts chapter 18. Um, it's describing uh, Priscilla and Quilla and this one interaction they have with Apollos. It says, now a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was competent in the use of scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus, although he only knew John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God more adequately. You know, I always look at Priscilla and Aquila as hashtag relationship goals. Right? I love that they were partners in the gospel. If you study them out, you'll see they, they, they had several house churches in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Rome that met at their house. They were, they were a spiritual power couple. Paul was never married, but how could he write so eloquently about marriage in, in over three different books? I truly believe it's from the time he spent living with Priscilla and Aquila and seeing their example, seeing it lived out. The Holy Spirit was like, that's what I'm talking about. And so, one of the things that I just love about me and Natasha's relationship 
is the, 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 over the years, the couples we've studied the Bible with and baptized, the journey we've been on together to make disciples together, to be fishers of men and women. I think a lot like Priscilla and Aquila, there, there's, some, there's some people that we only would have been able to reach as a couple and not as individuals. And so when you think about this idea that we also need to be partners in the gospel, it will make your marriage even better. You know, we end up, the friends we went to the Super Bowl with uh, last year, Derek and Shantae, we essentially baptized our best friends. Right? We studied the Bible with them. They became Christians, and, and we became best friends over many years. I mean, it's such a, a joyous journey together. I think about the fact that because we've both submitted to the kingship and lordship of Jesus, we share convictions about church. We share convictions about discipling about parenting. You know, it's not an argument as to whether or not we're going to set aside money to send our kids to the swamp. It's not. Right? right? There's nothing, there's nothing, uh, there's no argument about, man, should we give money to the church? No, because we both have these same convictions. I appreciate, even this morning, Natasha said to me, honey, you know what, one of the things I like to start doing, I like us to start fasting together. And I just appreciate that so much. Heard about a brother that uh, this last year, I think it was either for Christmas or for his wife's birthday. He said, honey, what do you want? And she said to him, honey, you know, I'd really just like for you to start taking prayer walks every single day. That's what I want for my birthday or for Christmas. I want you to take prayer walks every single day. And, and it's been amazing. He's been just telling me how it's just changed his spiritual life, changed his marriage. It's just been so amazing. But to think that he had a partner that thought, this is, this is what I would like for my birthday. Again, a, a spiritual partnership. It's really interesting. You think about in Luke 22, Jesus says, you know, at the end of all things, there's not going to be marriage anymore in heaven. We're going to be like the angels. So there's not going to be, people aren't going to be given in marriage anymore. But, but I truly think about when I get to heaven, I'm going to be blown away and in awe of Jesus. And I'm just going to be floored at the magnitude and grace of our Savior. And, and when I see Natasha, I think what I, what the, the overwhelming feeling I'm just going to have is gratitude. You know, you are the person outside of Jesus Christ most responsible probably for me making it here today. Right? Is that my spouse is my spirit. Natasha is my spiritual partner. Sasha is my first discipling partner, if you will, because she sees me like nobody else does. And so I think, you know, that's what our marriages should be like. Man, I'm just going to be so grateful, right? There's not going to be any more romance in heaven, but I think I'm just going to be so grateful. Man, you just helped me so much on this journey with Jesus, walking with Jesus and walking with you together. That's, that's what our marriage is about. And so I'm going to close out in Ephesians chapter 5. It's the verse I encourage you to read uh, this week. Um, it's sort of what Paul's writing about what I think is what this partnership should look like. Over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church." since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ in the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. You know, I talk about having other couples in your lives, right? And talk about discipling. This is what we're being discipled to. I need people in my life that help us get back to this as the standard. Not modern psychology, not great books that are written, not what, just what we think, not the example, good or bad, that we saw from our parents or others. It is this. This is the standard of what it means to be partners in the gospel as a married couple. And so when I look at this passage, I think about this is the reason God hates divorce. This isn't to shame somebody who's gotten divorced, but, but marriage uh, between husband and wife is meant to reflect Christ in the church. The bride of Christ, and Christ is the husband. 
This is the reason why I think biblically gay marriage is not right. Now, government can do whatever it wants in terms of contracts between consenting adults and individuals, and society can do whatever it wants, right? But I think that a marriage between a man and a woman, that is meant to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. That's why, right? That is why. And so, as we close, I don't want to make more to marriage than it is. Here's the deal. If you're single and you never get married, you can be a great follower of Jesus. You can have a fulfilling life. Paul was never married. Jesus Christ was never married, right? There are other relationships that are important. Being a brother, a sister, a friend, right? A cousin, a relative, just being a disciple of Jesus, right? Being married is not the end-all be-all. You can be happy and fulfilled without being married. But I also don't want to make less of it than it is. After a relationship with God, even more so than a relationship with children, this is the most important relationship you can have on the face of the earth. And so, uh, what I want to do, we're about to take communion in a moment, but I asked a couple of couples here at, at Cornerstone to just share, you know, a couple of bits of advice um, and, and some things that have worked for them about what, you know, what they think makes their marriage great. So we want to hear from some of the experts here. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to take communion. And as you do, remember that Christ gave himself up for the church. Christ gave himself up for you, right? And so let's, let's think about his sacrifice for us, and let's mimic that in our marital relationships. Let's think about his blood that was spilled out for us, his body that was broken for us. And then look, look at our spouses and say, man, I will be giving to you as God has been given to me. So that's the sermon today. Let's go after being great friends, great lovers, and great partners. Thank you so much for your time. Happy Valentine's Day. Why is somebody over there? We said we were going to follow the CDC guidelines and stay six feet apart and wear a mask. Remember? When did we decide that? The other day when I was talking to you about it when you were on your computer. I don't call that. Guess you didn't hear me again. One of the keys to our marriage is effective communication. So make sure when you're talking to your spouse, it actually listen to you when you speak. Happy Valentine's Day, babe. Huh? Just name, name amen. amen. Hi. Hi, my name is Moses Singh, and this is my wife, Mamta. We've been married for 25 years. In fact, we're here in Highlands, North Carolina, celebrating our 25th anniversary. And two things I'd like to share to make a marriage very successful and enduring is, first thing is, we, we pray, pray together. together. And the second thing is, we, we, we play, play together. together. Hi, we're the Alberts. I'm Jim. And I'm Cindy. And we have been married for 32 years. Uh, no, 36 years. No, 30, 36 years. <laughs> and we want to share with you what we feel are the keys to a great marriage. One is romance. Oh, and fun. <laughs> and no matter how bad it gets, sometimes you just have to laugh. <laughs> Greetings, Cornerstone family. This is Steve and Betsy. We have been married for 43 years. Uh, coming up 44 on uh, March the 11th. So it won't be long. So here's our 30 seconds worth of advice. Happy Valentine's Day. And um, I would say once you meet your Prince Charming and you love everything about him, don't make the mistake that I did and spend several years trying to change him to be like me. Man, that was rough. Uh, my uh, 15 seconds worth would be out of Ephesians 5, um, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And uh, for us as husbands to understand our highest calling our number one job responsibility and um, is to be a great husband uh, over any other church activity or business activity or hobby. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Greetings and a good a kiss.
Good morning, Cornerstone. My name is Jim. This is my lovely wife, Pam, and we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we want to be able to share with you two points this morning. I'm going to share the first point, and the first point is that we need to have communications in our marriages. Uh, guys, that means talking, if you don't understand that, not grunting. But really, you know, talk with your wife. Uh, find out what her needs are, share what your needs are, and discuss those things. Uh, the other point that comes out of communication is not trying to solve every single problem. But really express your feelings with each other and never assume anything with each other. Always communicate what you're thinking and, and share with one another. Now, Pam's going to share a second point. The second point that uh, I'd like to share is that of having relationships with other couples. Uh, couples that uh, can be in your marriage when you are stuck and you just need uh, some support to help you get through that. In our early college days, we had Laird and Sandy Hartman, who still are great friends now after, golly, probably 45 years or more. Uh, as we moved on to Atlanta, we had JP and Pat Tynes. And, um, also, later in our marriage, we had Bill and Rebecca Mapes. Currently, we've been able to uh, have uh, Sherman and Kathy Davis involved in our lives and help us through um, a few little tough times here and there in our marriage. So relationships with other couples are definitely an important thing. So happy Valentine's Day, Cornerstone.